very nice to be here in Sweden and in Scandinavia, which I consider to be the home of sustainable consumption and production, uh, which was really began in a place called Kabelweg in Norway in 1994, when uh, the first working definition of sustainable consumption and production was produced. Uh, it's very nice to be in a room where we have national authorities, local authorities, regional authorities, and one UN institution. We have the four levels we need, national, sorry, local, national, regional, global. Uh, and this is one of the huge challenges we face, actually, is bringing those levels together and exchanging experience and tools between those levels. And it is not done nearly enough. So I would really like to thank you, Mayor for enabling us to do this here uh, and giving me already a lot of insights yesterday in the short time I was here and more today. It's also nice to follow Hugo, who was <laughs> the senior EU negotiator that helped us get the 10-year framework of programs in the Rio Plus 20 negotiations and in the uh, very messy Commission on Sustainable Development negotiations the two years before that. We nearly lost this framework. Uh, it came back in Rio in 2012. And it is a voluntary, uh, it is a voluntary set of programs, but it is really crucial. It was actually the only thing formally adopted at Rio Plus 20. And it's a framework for capacity building and international cooperation to support the shift to sustainable consumption and production patterns. Really crucially, in 2015, we got a phenomenal reinforcement of this framework from Agenda 2030. And this entire sustainable development goal on sustainable consumption and production, which has in it uh, 11 targets. This is only one. Uh, this one is up here because it talks about the 10-year framework of programs. And Basically, in 2015, countries agreed to implement the 10YFP, the 10-year framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production patterns. That's the last time I'll say that. <laughs> All countries taking action, with developed countries taking the lead, taking into account the development and capabilities of developing countries. This is language from the original Rio plus 20 text. This is really important. It's about international cooperation, but it's about the North supporting the South. That last line is our website, and that's probably the most important thing for anybody who doesn't know anything about the 10YFP, because I don't have time to tell you all about it. So note that website down and go to it afterwards. It's an improving website. It needs to be improved further, but that is the virtual web platform for the 10YFP. The 10YFP is not one framework. It's six programs. The most important thing about the 10YFP is the partnerships in the programs. And down the right-hand side, you will see them there. Sustainable food systems, sustainable lifestyles and education, building and construction, consumer information, sustainable tourism, and sustainable public procurement. Five of those are the product of the negotiations in Rio and CSD before that. Uh, and the sixth, sustainable food systems, was added simply because it's so important and governments asked for it to be added. These are multi-stakeholder partnerships, each of these programs, which have anywhere between 40 and 160 partners in them. The total number of partners in the 10YFP is 518, and they're scattered across those six programs. Some institutions are in, such as Worldwide Fund for Nature, are in two programs, possibly even three. I think they're in sustainable building and construction, sustainable lifestyles, and sustainable food systems. They have quite a complex governance structure. The programs are autonomous. They define what they do. They evolve. Uh, and the core of those program partners actually implement on the ground. And you can see the breakdown, or I hope you can, at the back. 9% of these partners are UN or intergovernmental organizations, 15% from the business sector, 40% from civil society, local authority, 0%, which is, from my perspective, quite unfortunate, but we hope that will change. National government, 21%, scientific and technical organizations, 15%. You've got the numbers down the side. There are 20 UN entities 
in this uh, framework. We have 129 formally designated national focal points who usually sit in environment ministries. Very importantly, we have a measuring framework to measure what these programs are producing. And you know, we will only produce impact four or five years down the road. Impact is when you actually change stuff happening on the ground, like increasing material use efficiency, increasing energy efficiency, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We're at the stage, we're at the output stage, where the programs, and we've, I'll show you the results of our first reporting, which was from 2016. We have projects, we're starting to generate finance for the shift to consumable consumption and production. We're doing training. We definitely have a network. We have, we're enhancing our outreach and communications to get more partners, to get people to come into the programs, to get people to ask the programs to do things, to raise money for the programs. And we're producing more knowledge and technical tools. The intermediate phase is outcomes where you start to see policy instruments generated by these programs that governments put in place. And those policy instruments will then lead to impacts. But there are other things. There are educations. There are voluntary commitments. There is coordination just to bring the different actors together to increase the scale. And I, I would emphasize that coordination and bringing actors to increase the scale is the quickest and the most vital thing we have to do to get the scale we need. Because one of the problems we have is SCP, one way or another, has been going on since 1994. We have a lot of good models, but they're really small, scattered, fragmented. And what Hugo said about what they're doing in the EU, we're trying to do as well. We're not really trying to invent anything new. We're just trying to build on what is there, but really build it and make it a more integrated and coherent package. So the EU circular economy 2.0 will be a better circular economy package because it will be integrated. They will know what the gaps were. They will know what the coordination was lacking. And we're finding this out through the programs too. We have to report. We're a UN institution. We have this. We are the secretariat of the 10YFP. We have to report to be accountable to our governments. And there is an indicator for our target, which was implemented at 10YFP. And it is number of governments developing, adopting, or implementing policy instruments aimed at supporting the shift to SCP. So this is the really important point is where you get to policy and legislation. What is the role of policy and legislation in all this? Voluntary is all very nice and cuddly, and it's what some governments only want us to do, but it's not enough. You need a baseline of, of policies and regulation. Otherwise, it, it doesn't come together, it's not incentivized. You won't get first movers without some kind of incentive, whether it's regulatory, or an economic instrument, or enhanced reputational risk, or aggressive civil society, which is also a quite vital part of this equation. And I use the word aggressive advisedly, because I used to be part of civil society. <laughs> um, and what we have to do with this indicator is actually to monitor the implementation and impacts of national policy instruments for sustainable consumption production in the context of meeting this SDG target 12.1, the one I first put up. And we're doing annual progress reporting. We did it for 2016. This indicator framework will not sit still either. We're, we're working on it to improve it so that it really does produce meaningful results. And with this reporting, we hope to identify, replicate, and scale up best practices, which if you wanted to reduce the task of the 10 YFP to one thing, it's that first line. It's, it's, it's nothing more or less than replication and scaling up. It will enable us to assess and improve performance to inform the planning of activities and allocation of funds. So it will help us help the programs design themselves, but also help governments design what they do and what other stakeholders do. It will report and demonstrate progress for accountability to all actors, and especially donors, and we hope that that means that donors will give it more money. 
it will communicate the results to a wider public. So we, we do have to make this more popular and dumb it down from that really long and cumbersome title, which we're going to do in the next couple of months. We're going to rebrand the 10YFP because nobody knows what the 10YFP is. And it's going to help us to mobilize the political and financial support, without which not much will happen. So 2016 reporting results, 518 program partners, 572 voluntary commitments, 140 projects operating on the ground. Uh, quite a lot of them, you know, about $7 million worth being funded through the 10YFP, but a lot of them beyond the 10YFP and associated with the programs through the partners. 513 outreach and communications materials, 291 resources and technical tools, 32,533 person days of training on sustainable consumption production. That's the detailed slide, which gives it to you all. Um, I'm not going to go through it. Perhaps just one thing, a total of nearly $18 million associated, either going through the 10 YFP mechanisms, but most of it not, but associated with those six programs, their objectives, those activities to help stakeholders, including governments, shift to sustainable consumption production. You know, and there are a variety of other ones, the 572 SCP commitments of varying sizes, but all voluntary. The organizers, um, sorry, last slide on just the reporting. Why, why should you report? Why should those 518 partners in the programs actually report back to us, go to the trouble? So we have to give them a rationale for this. And this is the rationale. It showcases your efforts, your tools, your progress, and your impact. Uh, if you put it in the context of 10 YFP programs, you get a RIA plus 20 mandate and an SDG behind you. And it will it will be visible to countries and they may use it uh, to help them shift to SEP and just to scale up and replicate good practices. It gives you a chance to share your experience and tools. So it's a bit like the first one, but also to learn about those of others and to pull in their experience to make your tools and your activities better. It gives you a chance to report against the SDGs, against this framework which is actually huge because that is going to drive a lot of policy making and funding decisions of government. It is, it is an excellent text. It's the best UN text since Agenda 21, but it's reduced to goals, targets, and indicators. So this is, this is actually going to drive a lot of government activity, I would predict. And what, what Hugo said, environment has now come into the mainstream of economic and development policy making. And, you know, it will inform our, the 10 YFP strategy 2018 to 2022. We've been doing this, or we will have been doing this by the end of this year for five years. We're going into the next five years of the, the uh, 10 YFP. So we have our 10 YFP 2.0, which is going to come out of this development of this strategy, which will be ready in time for the high-level political forum in New York in July next year. And if you get involved with us in uh, actually in that midterm review that we're currently undertaking, you can actually become more fully a part of the 10 YFP. So the organizers asked me to talk about the challenges that we've had in the first five years. And so I've got two slides here. One is on the challenges and, and the other one is on for responses that I hope we could discuss to some extent. If not in this session, then for the remaining sessions. So what have we found most difficult? Number one, going to scale quickly. We have been doing this for five years, but it's still, even within the individual programs, it's hard to pull it together and to get scale. Uh, somebody from the Department for International Development in the UK in April said to me, we believe in SCP. We've seen the proof of the SCP concept. What we need now is proof of scale and scalability. And we don't have that. And I thought, wow, nobody ever said that to me before. And I thought, you are so right. So there isn't much scale out there. And it's still going to be hard. And we have to, do, we have to 
determine more accurately how to build on the many but fragmented and disconnected SCP policies, practices, and initiatives. A lot of things that are not called SCP are about SCP. How do we pull them together? Uh, I've mentioned the four levels of action. I think this is really important. I don't have much time to talk about it, but rooms like this where you've got the four levels are really important. People who work at those different levels. We all work one way or another on SCP, but we're working in our own little level silo, if you like. And that, that has to change because it has to be transmitted. And generally speaking, it has to be transmitted from the ground up. You know, the HLPF doesn't hear much from people working at national authority level who really know which policies work and which ones don't and can see the effect on a day-to-day -day basis. It's even harder for national policymakers to see that. But we need that reality check. We have to forge more interministerial cooperation. Most of the policies that matter for sustainable consumption production are not written by environment ministries. They're written by somebody else, agriculture ministries, the ministries of urban, urban development. You know, all think of the names of the programs. Sustainable public procurement is the finance ministry. We have to change their minds, and, and getting that to work is, is another you know, multi-year task. We have to engage the private sector for action beyond words. Uh, we have to incentivize them. Some of them are incentivizing themselves. They see the future and they're moving. But they're going to need regulation. They're going to need economic instruments. There is, there is a minimum and perhaps quite a big minimum you need to get scale. And that may be, maybe, and I was discussing with Alex and a, a little bit with, with Hugo, uh, maybe this is the key actually, is we don't actually have enough formal incentivization of the private sector and others. We need a, a bit more to really get to scale. Engaging citizens and consumers is really powerful. We need a broad-based campaign. We need to explain to them what this is, and we need to motivate them to act. And we need funding for implementation on the ground, which has to be linked to the scale of issue. It can't come from environment ministries. They don't have enough money. We have to change the mind of treasuries and development and cooperation ministries on this. So. My last slide, I have got another one on the 10 YFP strategy, but I'll save that for later because I'm running out of time. Uh, but these are, as I was coming across on the plane, trying to think about how do we implement at scale. Number one, portfolio approach to the programs. A lot of those things you saw reported on that, on that big slide, a lot of those actions are not formally within the programs there things that the partners in the programs were doing before, but they've decided to associate them with the programs because they're fully aligned. And this portfolio approach has resulted in a, a sudden expansion of the 10 YFP. We, we've got a lot more activities in there, and we think this is really important. It's also a way of bringing it together. When you put these things together, people see what others are doing, and they see how they can do what they're doing better and how they can put things together, which is it's nothing more than that. It's putting things together in a coherent and effective way. And that is the way that you will get SCP, that you will show that SCP works at scale. That, that's the proof we need. Link national and local first. Never occurred to me before yesterday on the plane, but I thought looking at the participants list and, looking at, and listening to some of the experience yesterday, the interaction between local authorities and national policymakers is crucial. Sometimes it's difficult because often it's just about the money. But we've got to break that down. What works, at, what works at local authority level could work at national level, could work at regional level, could work at global level. We need to know. But the people in New York at the High Level Political Forum don't know. Highlight the economic and social gains of SCP. Other ministries will mostly in brackets, only be motivated by these. Don't forget that. If you're going to get the finance ministry engaged, if you're going to get the Devon Corporation ministry engaged, those are the questions they're going to ask you. They're going to say, where's my value for money? What's the development effect? If you can't show the social and economic gains, they're not interested in SCP. You know, however much Hugo and I, sort of, and Gunilla and all the other 10 YFP national focal points in the room, bang them over the head. They're not interested. It's not their job. So we have to show them 
that it really is about sustainable development. You need to mobilise actors with campaigns. You need the inventive, innovative, aggressive civil society angle to push things through when you need, so that maybe sometimes when we do need regulation, the only way you'll get that is with active civil society. And I think in thinking about mobilising actors, I would focus on NGO coalitions and getting this into the media, the general media, print, whatever. But just get the message out, because we've got to reach a lot of people. And then we have to move beyond traditional donors. We have our own set of pet donors who we keep going to for money, but we've got to get the development cooperation agencies fully engaged on this. More private foundations, more progressive companies, and we've got some very good ones in some of the programs, but we need a lot more than the 9% membership we have from the private sector, and we're working on it. And we need some visionary donors, somebody who would maybe put a, just give us, five million over five years, a sort of core funding to go out and do really push the envelope stuff. Um, that was it. Thank you.